Welcome back to the Sim Project, everybody. My name is Dave, uh, and today we're going to talk about the success I had with building the GTC 570 from Build to Fly. Now, uh, you may remember from last uh, video that uh, I talked about Build to Fly. They were kind of one of the videos that uh, popped up on the YouTube algorithm that sent me down this whole rabbit hole of building a home flight deck thanks to 3D printers and, of course, uh, Carl over at Helimec. Now, uh, I kind of stumbled across this set of plans by mistake on Thingiverse uh, as Built to Fly. They haven't made a video yet for this, and I'm not trying to step on their toes, but, you know, they have had this out on Thingiverse for four or five months now, so I hadn't seen a video yet. I did run into a couple little issues in the build, and I figure before anybody else gets too far into these uh, this build project that I'd like to bring them up to speed of uh, what I found. Now, first of all, the download package was phenomenal. Uh, the files were really nice. I dropped them into my slicer program, put them on the printer, no issues whatsoever. Uh, I did skimp out a little bit when it came to building the shelf to hold uh, the unit. Initially, the slicer told me it was going to be a 25-hour build. Uh, the other parts in total only took about 20 hours to build, so I well, couldn't quite figure out why this shelf was going to take so much longer. So I uh, opened up my... Uh, Print settings a little bit. I increased my uh, build layer from uh, 0.2 millimeter to 0.4, lowered the infill down to about 15%, and that took the build to under seven hours. Doing that, however, I did create a little cosmetic uh, blemish in, a, in the uh, shelf in a couple spots. Doesn't hurt the structure of anything, but you know, if you were to get down and look at it, you could see these cosmetic marks. Really and truly, it's not a big deal. Like I say, it's a shelf. Uh, you're not going to see it, so it really doesn't matter. Talking about the shelf, the only thing I would suggest is maybe only because uh, in the previous video from build to fly they show their unit sitting next to a Satec panel. Uh, put some holes in it, guys, for the uh, to mount to a Satec uh, panel uh, frame. Uh, that's what I've done. I'll uh, show a little video clip here. Uh, worked out well. Drilled a couple holes, lined it up, no big deal. Um, I didn't have proper screws to get in because, of course, those being our metric, which I know we're in Canada, I should have some metric screws. I don't. Everything's imperial. Don't ask me, it's a whole uh, crazy uh, thing to try and deal with. Anyways, I uh, punched a couple holes in it, used some of the thumb screws I had left over from some of my other static panels, put it in, uh, holds great. Uh, the other thing I did, I drilled a couple cross holes to put a couple zip ties in to hold the unit to the stand, uh, just because I noticed it does feel a little uh, uh, top heavy. I'm not quite sure why, because everything is in the bottom, but it is a little uh, top heavy the way the screen sits in it, and I was having an issue with it falling off the stand couple zip ties, correct that problem, no issues. The only thing I did find, uh, and if anybody tries to build themselves, the wiring diagram is phenomenal. Uh, really nice PDF, lays everything out great. Uh, the only thing there is, is a mistake on pins six, sorry, pins seven and eight. Uh, they are reversed. Uh, it took me a little troubleshooting to figure out why my encoder wasn't working until I flipped those around and away it went. And the other thing that maybe it's showing and I'm just not seeing it or it's not there, um, your Charlie pin on all your encoders have to be tied to ground. Um, and the drawing, it, it kind of makes it a little hard to see if it's actually being done in their uh, wiring diagram. Um, it's just, you know, mental note, uh, ground those Charlie pins. Now, as far as parts go, uh, their links on Thingiverse take you to a German electronics uh, website. So, you know, a little Google uh, translate from German to English. I was able to figure out what parts they were using. I uh, jumped over to DigiKey and all those links are included in the description below. Uh, the DigiKey store now, it, it's the Canadian store. You should just be able to change your location to the US and all the links should be the same or to anywhere else in the world you might be buying parts. Um, it was like $25 worth of parts from DigiKey. The screen on Amazon was $75 Canadian as well. On Amazon, I got the Arduino Mini, about $25 bucks for it as well. All in all, I'm under $140 Canadian to this, making this, yes, about a $100 build uh, US. The only thing I would do, they recommended using uh, some little pre-made wires with some pins uh, for quick connecting. On the prototype side, that worked really well. I had no issues, especially when I did find the two wires were reversed. They made it real easy to flip them around. If I was to do this again, now that I've got the prototype side figured out, I would just hardwire everything. I wouldn't use the pins. I'd just I'd get some 24 gauge wire and solder everything directly from the Arduino over to the uh, encoders and uh, do away with the pins. They don't seem to hold very well. 
they're all pre, you know, they're six inches long. So you've got this extra wire to try and manage. Uh, the other thing I had to do, I do uh, use some black tape and some foam to create a, uh, an insulation barrier between the Arduino and the back of the touchscreen, uh, just so it didn't short the touchscreen out and cause some other crazy things to happen. For cabling, for the uh, HDMI and the USB connected to the touchscreen, I ordered those with a 90 degree connector on them, just for better cable management, make things cleaner. Uh, for the USB that goes to the Arduino board, I just used a straight cable that came with that, uh, just because it sits so far down, you really don't need the 90 degree. There's enough cable flex, you can uh, tie it to the other two cables and uh, make it nice and clean. As far as interfacing with Microsoft Flight Simulator, uh, those of us using it, we all know there are no default pop-out panels as of yet, other than the uh, the basic default ones for the G1000s. Uh, um, there is a nice little add-on on Flight Sim.2. I'll put a link to that in the description as well. Uh, it's a pop-out panel manager. The only thing with it is um, because when you use it on a touch screen, Microsoft Flight Simulator is no longer the active window and unlike older versions of P3D, x -Plane, things like that, where you could still use all your controls um, even though the sim isn't the active window, Flight Simulator doesn't like that. So what I've had to go and create um, a profile within SPAD Next and FSUIPC to run all my controls. So when you use a touchscreen, all of a sudden, you know, your yoke doesn't quit or your throttles don't stop working, things like that. The other thing to take note of with the pop-out panel manager, uh, it doesn't work until you turn power onto the aircraft. Uh, so you turn your aircraft power on first, then start that program, and it'll pop panels out for you nice and smoothly. If you try and do it the other way around, you just get an error in the software, and uh, you've got to restart it. So overall, five out of five on this one, uh, build to fly. I can't wait to see what you guys come up with next. Uh, as for me in the channel, currently, I'm not sure if you can hear it over there, the 3D printer is printing the parts for the Garmin G1000 from uh, 737 DIY Sim. Fingers crossed, hope to get working on that here in the next uh, few weeks, but uh, it's a little bigger build and I'm uh, I'm sure we're gonna be a month or so before we ever get to see a video on that. And then plus I've gotta figure out how I'm gonna mount it. So until then, hope you enjoyed, please subscribe to the channel and uh, until next time, thanks for watching.